I'm in Centennial Park on a secret mission. So secret, I'm not actually sure what I'm looking for. Lucky my friend John knows what we're doing here. We're looking for Australia's biggest owl, but it's nocturnal, so it'll be asleep right now. So I've got my binoculars, let's have a look. Actually, the best way to find them at night time is to listen for them, but during the day, there's another effective way. We're gonna search the ground and see if we can find a pellet. Please tell me that owl pellet isn't a nice word for owl poo. No, it's the remains of their dinner. It's the bits that they can't digest and that they've spat back out. So, we're on the hunt for owl vomit. Great. So here's a question I never thought I'd ask. What does owl vomit actually look like? So it's about the size of your thumb and it's a ball like a bunch of fur and you'll dig in there and we might see some bones, but sometimes you'll see bones are laying around as well, so parts of an animal. So powerful owls are serious predators and really big meat eaters, so we're probably going to be looking for some really big chunks. What's the biggest animal that they could actually eat? So we commonly see them eat things like brush-tailed possums. I read that they've actually caught a koala. That is true. There is an account of a powerful owl with a koala, but that's quite exceptional. John? Ugh, I think I've found it. It looks like a big fluff ball. That is definitely a pellet. Should we take a closer look? Definitely. All right, I'm going to put my gloves on for this. Okay, so talk me through what we're seeing here. I can see bones, and is that fur? This is definitely fur. So we've got the, uh, the parts that the, that the owl can't digest of its prey from last night, and I would suggest that this is actually bones and fur from a flying fox. So that's a bat? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Yeah, a fruit bat. They're big and chewy. <laughs> <laughs> Look, flying foxes are quite big, uh, so they can weigh up to a kilo, uh, but, and they've got a big wingspan, but yeah, the powerful owls are bigger, and uh, they are certainly on the menu. So it was a flying fox, but how would it have caught it, and would it have been a big battle? So owls are essentially silent as they fly, and they'd be watching the animals in the, in the trees and then they would find one that's in a vulnerable position and swoop in and grab it and then the owl will keep flying and find a branch to perch on. There'll be a bit of a battle but it can be pretty quick. So why is it in a big ball like this? So the owl eats chunks of the prey and then the fur and the bones that can't be digested form a ball in the stomach that gets spat back out. Ew, that's disgusting. This is a good indicator though that there's an owl around so let's try and find it. John, I don't think they're here, are they? No, uh, we haven't had any luck here. I really, really want to try and see one today. Is there anywhere else I can look? There's another spot you can try. So if you go down the hill, across the road, there's a big tree called a cowrie tree. Have a look in there. The powerful owl is likely to sleep in the shadiest tree it can find. So if John's seen pellets here before, this seems like a good place to look. I can see it! I can see it! Yay! I found him! He's just up there, he's sleeping. He's up in the branch and he's kind of like a big round ball of feathers and he's kind of in a dark corner and his head's all tucked into his wing. He looks like he's having a nice sleep. Well, that's another successful mission completed.
pimples are the worst and they always turn up at exactly the wrong time. But what exactly are they and why are they trying to ruin our lives? Well, pimples don't care about your life or mine and they're certainly not trying to ruin them. I hope. <sighs> Glands in the skin naturally produce oil or sebum, which waterproofs your skin. Sometimes sebum clumps together dead skin cells in the pores, which blocks them up. But your body keeps making sebum, which builds up behind the blockage and makes a pimple. Bacteria that lives on the skin may feed on the sebum, creating further inflammation and irritation on the skin through the byproducts of their digestion. Nom, nom, nom. Pretty gross, huh? Ugh. So what should you do when a big nasty zit appears? Well, you're going to want to pop it, but don't. Popping the pimple exposes the sebum to more bacteria and it can cause an infection. The pimple will just disappear on its own after time. It can also push the sebum and bacteria deeper into the skin, causing further problems. Pimples can leave permanent scarring, so trust me, don't squeeze it. It will just eventually go away on its own. It's no coincidence that you'll get a pimple right before your end of year school disco. If you're anxious or worried, that pimple will rear its ugly second head. Stress can be a big factor in getting pimples and so can your diet. Oily and sugary foods can affect your oil production. Right, well, these are finished and look, ready to pop. What do you think of my pimple cupcakes? Can't wait to pop these. So, Kristen, <laughs> if you can see with this cupcake, this is the inflamed skin where bacteria has been trapped by the sebum and the bacteria is making it even worse. So it's a really angry, pussy red pimple. Looks delicious. It does look delicious. You want to squeeze? Yes. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> That's hell. <laughs> oh. These pimples are delicious. And they're the only ones you should ever squeeze. <laughs> The thought of rotten food isn't the most appetising thought. Gross, mouldy veggies, off eggs, yuck. But what if I told you that eating some rotten food is actually good for you? Now, I don't mean out-of-date food or anything that's actually rotten. Fermenting foods, it's a special way of preserving them that can actually be really good for your gut. Fermented food sounds like something an alien would eat, or maybe that a zombie would have on a special occasion. Funky fermented finger with side of brain? <laughs> Yummy! Now, I'm getting the feeling that you guys might not believe me, but you should believe my friend Margaret, who is an expert at fermenting foods. Margaret, what is fermenting? Fermenting is putting food in a container with some salt and letting it go through changes caused by bacteria and fungi which contain enzymes, and enzymes break down sugars and uh, starches in our food in veg and create fermented food. So why is fermented food so beneficial? It's very beneficial because it contains living bacteria. Alive? What do you mean it's alive inside me? Yes, it is. Bacteria is alive. It lives alive in our stomachs. But it's not like animals crawling around. They are really tiny, microscopic, so you don't feel what they do. And they digest our food. Nom, 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 nom. How long does it take to ferment food? It depends what you ferment and how. If you ferment things like cabbage, that will be three to four weeks. For fermented drinks, that will take about three to five days. So what kinds of foods can you ferment? You can ferment anything that has got starches or sugars in it. So even flour could be fermented. Wow. And uh, when it comes to vegetables, pick the ones which are a little bit sweetish. Things like cabbages or carrots or apples, they all ferment beautifully. Margaret, this food looks kind of funky. Are you sure it tastes good? Oh yeah, they are absolutely fantastic. And there are all sorts of fermented veg here. So we've got fermented cabbage, sauerkraut, we also have kimchi, which is Korean spicy ferment. And we have red cabbage ferment here. What is sauerkraut? It's German for soury cabbage, basically, which means fermented cabbage. And why are they different colours? Because they contain different veg, so the colours are different. Um, this one has got red cabbage inside. I like it. So it's one. red, yeah. Well, the fermenting facts are in, and it's time for me to create my own funky fermented feast. 
So, Margaret, what are we making today? It's going to be a sauerkraut, fermented cabbage, from cabbage and interesting purple carrots. Just remember, when you grate anything, watch out your fingers, because the graters can be really sharp. All right. Any more ingredients, Margaret? Yes, we need to salt this mixture. OK. How much salt should I put in? Four teaspoons per kilogram of veg. OK. OK, Margaret, the salt's in. What do we do next? We need to mix everything. Oh, well, where's the spoon? No spoon, you do this with your hands. Oh, <laughs> OK. And you squeeze as you mix. Squeeze and mix. Yes. All right, here we go. Oh, it's lovely and cool. It is. Oh, how much squeezing do I need to do? Till you see liquid running. There we go. Can you see it? Yeah. <laughs> Margaret, why do I have to squeeze the cabbage? Because we need the juices to be released. There has to be quite a lot of them. OK. Does it help the good bacteria ferment the vegetable? Yes, and also it excludes air from the mix. Okay. So when we've got all veg covered with liquid, there is no air. Well, Margaret, this looks pretty good. Am I done? Yes, you are, but you need to put it in a jar. Shove it in? Yes, shove it in <laughs> and press with your fist. OK. So once you put it in, yep. Do I have to squeeze the liquid out before it goes in the jar? No, no, you don't have to because we need the liquid as well. OK, it's all in there, Margaret. What happens now? Now we just need to close the jar and it's best to use an airtight one with rubber seal. So when you close it, the air does not get inside. All done. Great. So can I try it? Not yet. It needs about three weeks to ferment. But I prepared some beforehand, so you can try the one which is ready. I would love to try it. There you go. Wow. OK. Thank you. Wow. That's delicious, Margaret. It's zesty and tangy. Much better than freshly salted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fermenting, it's a lengthy process, but I can't wait for mine to be ready. It's delicious. Some awesome stories there. But back to the important question. Why is it vomit orange or green or purple? Obviously, different colours of vomit mean different things. <laughs> orange vomit usually means that you've got bits of undigested food in your stomach that haven't quite made it through the digestive system. Green and yellow vomit usually means that your stomach is empty, so you're not vomiting up food. You're actually vomiting up a substance called bile, which is produced by your body. And purple vomit, well, that means you're a dragon. OK, so I've got that sorted. The greenhouse effect is a term that scientists use to talk about the Earth's atmosphere. It's called the greenhouse effect because a greenhouse stays warm all year round. Sunlight shines through the glass walls and warms the air inside. The air then stays warm because the heat is trapped inside. The same thing happens with the Earth's atmosphere. The atmosphere is a thin layer of gases that surround the planet. During the day, the sun's rays pass through the atmosphere, heating up the Earth. At night, when the sun goes away, this heat is then released back into the air. Some of the heat is trapped by gases. We call these greenhouse gases because they act like a greenhouse. Today we're going to do a fun experiment to see how the greenhouse effect works. We're going to pretend that these two beakers are the Earth. We're going to cover one up with some plastic wrap to mimic the greenhouse gases. The second one we're going to leave open and we're then going to put both of them in the sun for 15 minutes. Hmm. After that, we're going to see what the temperature is. I have a feeling this one might be a bit warmer. I'm here with Edna. Oh, Edna! Cow farts are pretty gross, but they contain something in them called methane, which contributes to the greenhouse effect. billion cattle in the world and they all eat a lot. Grass is not the easiest food to digest. It produces methane, 
which goes up into the atmosphere and gets trapped. Some greenhouse gases are a good thing because without them, our Earth would be too cold for us to live. But too many greenhouse gases, our Earth gets too warm. Scientists call this global warming. Unfortunately, there is no quick fix for this, but we all need to work together to help. Luckily, scientists are working hard at breeding cattle that produce less methane. See you, Edna. I better go check on my experiments. It's time to check how an experiment's gone. It looks like the one that's got all the plastic covering over the top is a bit warmer. Let's have a look what the temperature is. So the one without the plastic has got a temperature of 37 degrees, which is about the same temperature as out here today. It's pretty hot. Now let's test our mini greenhouse. Have a look at that. Our mini greenhouse is already at 44 degrees. That's seven degrees higher than our beaker that didn't have a cover over the top. This shows that greenhouse gases really do warm our planet up. Ah, oh, Edna, I can smell you from here. I love a good vomit story. And I'm sure I'm gonna have one after I finish this ride. But why? It's because of something called motion sickness. And you may have heard this term before. Your inner ear is filled with tubes that contain fluid. They move when you move. When you're walking, your eyes are sending a message to your brain that you're moving. At the same time, your ears are sending a message to your brain that you're moving as well. Everything's okay. When you're on a roller coaster, you go through crazy twists and turns. So the fluid in your ear is constantly moving. And then you suddenly stop. And your eyes are seeing that you've stopped, but the fluid in your ear is sloshing backwards and forth to tell your brain you're still moving. <laughs> These messages are very confusing for your brain and make you feel sick. It doesn't help that the hot dog you just ate is jumping around in your tummy. I thought you guys were going to buy me lunch as well. Sorry, no. Woo! Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, we've got to go, we've got to go. Oh, Sorry, it's yeah. fine. Leaving food outside of a fridge and exposed to the sun is a perfect breeding ground for festy and harmful bacteria. Oh, look, Em's lunch is still here. No one will know it's been here all afternoon. If I just take a bite, maybe three. Ah, oh, Nathan. When you consume that bacteria, it can make you very sick. <laughs> but what about in winter, if it's snowing? It's about minus four degrees here at Mount Buller and the normal fridge temperature, around four degrees Celsius. So let's see what happens if I leave this food and drink outside in the elements overnight and come back in the morning. pretty heavily out there. I wonder if I'll be able to find it all tomorrow. All right, the food's been out here for about 12 hours now and it's looking pretty icy. The milk, it's all separated and turned into a slushy. The water's frozen. The banana, rock hard. And I can't even see the sandwich. While this result might not be quite as dangerous as letting food go rotten in the sun, freezing food doesn't actually kill that bad bacteria. It just puts the bacteria on ice to multiply later. And let's face it, even when they defrost, stale bread and mushy banana aren't exactly tasty. I'm not gonna eat it. So I think I'm gonna stick to the fridge and keep my food inside. Mm -hmm.